first ever Lesbian to Tech Coding Scholarship winners. Hi, I'm Nicole Castillo, and I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. Hi, my name is Annie Spage, and I am from Paris, France. Hi, my name is Shay Wilson, and I am originally from Seattle, Washington. I am Beatrix House, and I'm from New York. Hi, I'm Dom Brassi from Oakland, California. I found out about the scholarship, I think I got an email. Building my technical abilities is basically adding a superpower onto a person. Learning to code meant some sort of freedom to me, which is something that I really need. I think that this coding scholarship has the potential to make an incredibly huge impact on my life. I know that the scholarship is uh, indispensable to me. I, I know that it's to going towards me attending hack school and changing uh, my career, changing all the opportunities I can have, and really changing my life. What if I told you Edie Windsor was a lesbian who texts? Yep, that's right. Edie Windsor is not only the hero who helped all LGBTQ Americans win the freedom to marry the person they love, but she was also a leading software engineer at IBM. Hi, Edie. Um, thank you so much for the trail that you've blazed for us. Thank you for kicking ass. Oh my goodness, Edie. You're one of my heroes. I think you're courageous and incredible. And anytime that I think that I can't overcome a challenge, I can always look to you. You've set the, the ground for us to be able to continue um, to make strides for our community. So thank you. <laughs> I'm a mess. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, I don't know what else to say. I really am at a loss for words right now. This is going to be so embarrassing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I got nothing left. Edie, you have been such a treasure and such a gift to not only the entire world, but specifically to Lesbian 2 Tech. Your story of being a software engineer, or being a leading software engineer, literally the first person at IBM to receive a PC in all of Manhattan. This is a story we want to tell, and we want to tell it for generations to come. So we've decided to name our coding scholarship after you, the Lesbian 2 Tech Edie Windsor Coding Scholarship Fund. So forever, Lesbian 2 Tech, now and in the future, will know you, will know your story, know all that you've done, but also know you are a techie, and you're still a techie through and through. We love you. Lesbian Sue Tech, welcome to the stage, your 2016 Coding Scholarship winners and Leanne Pittsford. So what do you think about naming the scholarship fund after Edie Windsor? How many of you knew that she was a software engineer at IBM? Our hope with this award is that now everyone knows her story and her history. She was not only a software engineer, but she was a leading software engineer. And I, I encourage all of you to learn that part of her history. And we're so excited that she's here with us today. And we have our coding scholarship winners on stage. And they want to say something. Hi. <laughs> There may be tears. Um, um, I just want to thank Lesbians Who Tech for allowing me to be here. And um, Edie, I love you. I really do. And just thank you so much for allowing us to be here and allowing us to have that ring in our finger and be unbothered by everybody. And just for the innovation that you've given us in tech. You're, you're our hero. Just thank you. Thank you so much. Please welcome to the stage Edie Windsor.
It's just thrilling to be here. It's, thr it's thrilling to to have that named after me. I can't I can't tell you how much. I'm so grateful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Now you get 20 more minutes of eating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, where are we going? <laughs> All the way? <laughs> For a real treat this morning, we have the opportunity to hear more from Edie, and I would like to invite at this time Robbie Kaplan to join us up on the stage as well as... <laughs> as well as Mrs. Danielle Moody Mills, who will be conducting an interview for us so that we can learn more about this incredible woman that is before us. I'm so excited. You, like you know I'm deaf as hell. <laughs> we love you. We love you either way. <laughs> oh my God. How major is this? It's so major. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can't stand it. Okay. So, Edie, Robbie, you guys are like epic, epic icons, so I need to fan myself for a moment. <laughs> so, you just had this award named after you, saw the video for the first time. How do you feel? Well, as soon as I stop crying, okay, I'll be real fine. <laughs> I'm very exciting. I'm thrilled with it, just thrilled. And I'm, I, I, all kinds of wonderful stuff's been happening, happening to me. This is one of the most wonderful. <laughs> just thrilling. Oh my God, love. <laughs> uh, so, not everyone knows about your career at IBM. Only, you know, not everybody raised their hand, so I want you to be able to give them an understanding of what it was like to be at IBM. You started in 1958, and you were there for two decades. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your time there and what it was uh, like uh, in, for technology uh, at that time? Okay, well, first of all, I, uh, I started out... Uh, uh, I started out as a secretary at the Math Institute because I needed, I needed the job to get my tuition paid. And I wanted a master's in mathematics. And, uh, okay, okay. And, and I, quickly, I quickly became, I went to programming classes because there was time in between. And I quickly then uh, asked for a different job. And uh, it became, I forget what it's called, but it's... Uh, uh, anyhow, it's a kind of assisted scientist, whatever, and it put Something me. Something fancy. It put yeah. me on the computer. I learned to code, and I loved coding. All right. Now, I quickly graduated past coding to, okay, to, uh, I guess, architect. Really, into architecture almost immediately. Systems programming only, and. Uh, and ultimately, I got a, an award after I had left IBM. I got an award as a pioneer in operating systems. So, so I was very busy with that. Okay. Uh, but, uh, so but, one of the things that I heard, this is, this is what I learned the other day. Um, I'm so low tech, you know, so it's paper. Um, but one of the things that I learned, um, so everybody during this time, this coding time, Everybody is writing in different languages. They're all kind of creating their own language, and you didn't think that well, that made okay. sense. No, that really came later, and they weren't creating their own languages, okay? We were inventing languages. Well, and when I came in, Fortran had already been established, uh, but, but there, were, there were very little, few compilers. So my first job, in fact, was writing the last section of, of a Fortran compiler 
which, which involved getting it back into everything, back into English after, you know, after, after all of the mathematics had been done. Uh, the Fortran language itself, though, I, a lot of you know, or I don't know, it's so old. Do people still <laughs> use Fortran? Tell them. Okay. Uh, the, uh, it's the easy way to mathematics, but it got much fancier. For, I ended up, I was also studying and got a master's degree, and, uh, and, and I wrote my, my I, I wrote a, 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 a you know, my, my thesis was, was on a complicated fourth order equations and how to, you know, which didn't have, which required iteration to the real, to the solution. And by accident, uh, I, okay, I made my, my, my thesis ended up being uh, uh, original which it didn't have to be. By accident. It was an no accident. Big deal. It was truly an accident that a, a bunch of people showed me what to do on the machine, and I was watching a screen this big, watching things moving, iterating toward the solution, and, uh, and I realized at some point I had to change that direction. Okay, it was no longer getting closer to solution, mm -hmm. and that was new. Okay, I mean, up until then, nobody had known that. No one that. had done it. So I became like a small hero, okay? <laughs> uh, Tiny. Uh, okay, the library, the, the NYU library had it, and, uh, and then they were getting requests from all over for copies, mm -hmm. and I turned out I had a mistake in it. <laughs> Somebody with a hell of a lot more experience than I did came with me, we went to the library and said, because I hadn't needed my permission to, to send it out. Mm -hmm. And I said, you can send it out if you first give us five minutes to fix it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, which we did on the spot. Uh, and, then, and then it just kept going. Uh, at some point, there were, in systems already in progress, uh, there, were, um, there were bugs and corporate kept coming down into, into our or organization and complaining that people weren't ex accepting the, the computers. And, and so I, I was called a supervisor. Everybody later got hell for that. We don't have a thing called a supervisor. Either she gets promoted because she should be, or she doesn't. Okay, but that's all. Anyhow, I walked down an aisle mm -hmm. of you know, uh, kind of cubicles, say, asking people for each one of the bugs, these, these impossible bugs, asking, you know, could you do that? And the answer I got was, uh, can you get me machine time tonight? <laughs> and uh, cause of course you didn't have nice machines at your desk no. or even available. Right. And, uh, and by machines, and so, you know, so, computers. So, so again, I was a hero. <laughs> I was a hero because I had all these smart people in cubicles who solved the damn problems. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people in cubicles yeah. do. Yeah. They solve damn problems. Yes. Yeah. I loved talent, and, okay, and I think my real, my real talent was that I loved talent. And uh, so people worked for me like they were, hadn't been working. And, uh, and I made sure everybody got full credit for everything they were doing. So it just kept going. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, there came a time, though, when I, so I was very much in, 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 you know, in control and, and being appreciated. Uh, again, IBM then thought that programming was a one-shot problem. Mm. Okay, we, we put this software out so people will now accept the machines, and that would be the, pro the end of the problem. So we were a bastard group. We had, they took a floor in the Time Life building in, in, uh, okay, in New York, and, uh, and half of us had never had anything to do with IBM before. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and we proceeded to work. Uh, in the process, though, uh, it just... It just kept going. Finally, the corporate realized they needed, okay, they would need to upgrade us all because, uh, because they were gonna need this stuff some more. How so, many women at this time were, were working with IBM? Were, were, what? were you one of the few women that were doing no, this work? No, no, it's one of the things, and, and uh, 
Megan Smith confirmed for me for the first time right. that 40% of the people doing technology at that time in history were women. And I had, you know, I had a ton of, I, th I think at least a third of the people on that floor were women, wow. all smart, uh, okay? And, uh, I've, well, there were two people who came into my office, but by then I had the first promotion, okay? So I'm managing a little bit. And two women came into my office and wanted to talk about, uh, I don't even remember the word they, these words they used, but it turned out it was really internet that they were talking about. <laughs> And, uh, okay, but, uh, and, uh, and I said, tell me why it's important. Tell me what it is. Tell me why it's important. And they did that. And, uh, okay, two days what later. What did they say? I'm just curious. Okay. Why, why did they say the internet was important? Uh, uh, well, what? for the reasons that it is. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> then I know that. But, but this but is decades it ago. Registered. It wasn't yeah. registered with me yet enough that I could go to management and say, we need more money, we need more people, we need to do this. But, so I would call them back a couple days later and say, tell me again, <laughs> what is it, why is it important? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Finally, they got it into my head, I did get us the money, and we began to, okay, to do that. And then, yay, but, internet. But they were all smart women. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Wait a minute, I thought Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> I know, now we know it was eating. <laughs> Now, none of, okay, ultimately, I knew everybody very well, and none of them were lesbians. So, I, okay. <laughs> Did you ask? <laughs> uh, uh, the thing is that I lied all the time, mm -hmm. okay? I never told the truth, and we were good friends because we were this, this kind of separate group. Uh, we ate lunch together, we had drinks together after work. The only thing I didn't do was see, go out weekends with them mm. when, when everybody was doing wine test tasting because I, because I was gay. <laughs> but, um, yeah. uh, until years and years later, people said, Edie, why didn't you ever come to the wine tasting? And I said, because I was queer. <laughs> 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 okay. But we love uh, wine, yeah. anyway. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> aside from inventing the internet, working on, <laughs> working on machines, and like creating languages, you know, you are one half of the greatest love stories that I think I've ever heard. So... <laughs> Yeah. How many of you? As a matter of fact, the film about us, the oh, documentary. Yeah. I was going to tell them, but you tell them. Opened in this theater. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very big deal. It was a huge deal. Uh, How uh, many of you have seen uh, it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, tell us about your wonderful, very long engagement okay. of 41 okay. years. Well, first of all, I met this woman. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, okay, I won one of the fellowships that IBM was doing to upgrade us. Mm -hmm. And I went, to, I, went, I went to the wrong, I picked school of my choice, uh, degree of my choice, and uh, full salary, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty good. Except I didn't, there was no, there's still no literature. Uh, there were still no computer courses anywhere. Mm -hmm. And if I had chosen either MIT or even NYU, okay, where, where mathematics and, and the computers were very active, I didn't. I chose Harvard because there was a brilliant linguist guy mm -hmm. who was using, one of, using the computers for translating languages. And my interest was, was creating languages for using computers. Uh, so we did, we yeah. did Fortran, we did COBOL, uh, we did one which, you know, I'm losing words, okay? I'm 86 years old and I lose words, but, okay. You created, one, no one cares. Okay, there was you one, like okay, this. Okay, okay. One great language, okay, really uh, developed by, by most people mostly, mostly working for me, uh, which for, for which we wrote, we wrote one whole operating system. Uh, it died, it died because Late, because at exactly the point we, we really needed, needed it for the small machines. And it, we had people working on developing compilers for the, mm -hmm. 
for the small computers when, uh, when IBM lost its interest in software. And we had already, we had done studies of 10 years out, okay? And I was working, at one point, I spent a year being IBM's uh, strategist for, pro, for all programming languages. And, uh, and they, they just moved, moved it out and gave it away to Gates, okay? Ultimately, okay, okay. Uh, you guys know the Gates she's talking about, right? Uh, <laughs> And she just, she's just <laughs> dropping names. <laughs> no but, big uh, deal. But in the meantime, okay. Uh, uh, anyhow, I got, when I got back out of, out of school, I, I really quit in the middle. I didn't get a degree. Robbie and I later got honorary doctorates, which is very nice, because I never would have gotten one otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> So tell, so tell, so, so love. What? Tell, tell us about Thea. Oh, she, okay, she was a clinical psychologist. She was very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and when I met her, uh, okay, a friend of mine, I had really, I got back from school. Yeah. I, I was out of touch with everything. And, uh, and I finally, I called a friend of, an old friend of mine, and I said, please, if you know where the lesbians are, take me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, 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 and she took me to a restaurant that was run by a woman named Elaine Kaufman, mm -hmm. who later had Elaine's restaurant, which is very famous, at least in New York. Uh, and, uh, but at the time, she and her, and her boyfriend were, the, were just managing it, and it was not a gay bar or anything, but Friday nights, all the lesbians went there and were welcome. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'm sitting with my friend, and somebody else came over who knew my friend came over to say hello and to introduce Thea. Okay. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I, and I thought I'm on she the edge was of my great. Seat here. Okay. Yeah. I, we, okay. I ended up in her apartment. <laughs> Four of us. No, no, it's no good. It's no good. Okay. Uh, okay. We danced together. Mm -hmm. Okay, till I had holes in my stockings, very famous yeah. holes in my stockings. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is, I realized that she was living with someone, okay, Aren't they who always? was going to come home. So I left, I went home. Okay. <laughs> A year later, I learned she was living with someone else. Oh. So this was not easy. <laughs> and I was interested, but forget it, you know. Right. And, uh, the, the third, the beginning of the third year, uh, I, I heard, I was, I was in therapy. My thought was, I don't want to live without love. I was convinced that if, you don't, if you're a gay woman and you don't meet somebody when you're an undergraduate, forget it. Okay, it's not going to happen. Okay. Damn, okay. how do you all feel? <laughs> okay. And I was well along by then when, okay, when all of this happened with you. Anyhow, I heard she was there. I called up people. Uh -huh. And I was in a therapy thinking that if I could you know, adjust myself to, you know, to find some nice guy with the kids who needed a mother, you know, so I don't have to live without love all my life, kind oh. of. And that's when, when I heard that she was there in East Hampton alone. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 I called a house We got full off of, the therapist chair, yeah, and I we got in a car. I called a house full of lesbians, okay, and said, please, can I come out for the weekend? Mm. Okay, and that's when, that's when she and I, okay, began to date. Uh -huh. And for the first, the first year that we dated was not easy. Uh, I mean, it was wonderful, except sometimes she would stand me up. So, so I built a harpsichord, because I said, I'm not going to hang around here waiting for this woman to call me up. And I did build a harpsichord, which if anybody would like it, I will deliver it today. <laughs> and, uh, I'm pretty sure if yeah. you put it on eBay, okay. somebody By, will buy it. Okay. <laughs> By year four, she, uh, she suggested that we take a place together in the Hamptons. And, uh, and I, what I was afraid that if, if I spent the week, all weekends with her, then, you know, then I would want to stay with her, and, and that wasn't possible, I didn't think. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyhow, I did, and, uh, uh, and, and we really fell in love that year. Okay. Uh, also, she wanted them. She, I said, I can't really afford that, you know, to rent in the Hamptons. So she said, I'll, she'll pay for it. 
So, but she wanted a motorcycle. So I bought her a motorcycle, and then she wanted a white motorcycle. And yesterday, I saw a white motorcycle out on the street, a beautiful white, but there were none then, so I had to have it custom painted, okay, which I did. Okay. Uh, anyhow, Are you guys taking notes? And that notes? was the beginning. This is how you <laughs> land a woman. I don't have my engagement pin here. Okay, we were driving out to the Hamptons, and she said, suppose you got engaged would you wear an engagement ring to the office? Mm -hmm. you know, it's IBM. And I said, of course not. Everybody would want to know who is he and when do we meet him. Okay. So I had, a, I had an imaginary person named Willie, <laughs> who was the name of Thea's doctor that she had brought with her when she came from Amsterdam when she was a little girl. Okay. And uh, Willie still lives in my closet. Okay. Uh, uh, so in 2000, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna fast forward a bit to when you get married. So it's 2007. Yeah, okay. And we got engaged in, in 67. In 1967. Yeah. Okay, so we, we were engaged for 40 years. Okay, and, and, and then the minute it, it was possible, by then Thea was quite crippled with MS. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I asked her if it, it turned out that there was a case that, that where New York, it proved that New York accepted legal marriages for anywhere, even though they were not giving, you know, doing marriaging. And, uh, and so I went to Canada. Every, everybody went to Canada then to get married. Okay. Uh, and, uh, well, but, it, but it took a while, because first I asked her if she wanted to go, and, uh, and she said, not really, but if you really need it, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> So I said no, because it meant going without all her equipment, okay? Yeah. And I said no, unless, you know, unless we both have a passion about it, just forget it, it's not that important. And about a year later, she had a lousy prognosis, mm -hmm. she had a heart problem, and, uh, and she, had a, she asked how long she had, and the doctor said within a year. And, uh, and she, she got up the next morning and she said, you still want to get married? And I said, yes. And she said, me too, and now. Okay. <laughs> so that's what we did. We went to Canada and got married. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, Robbie, so here we are. Gets married, 2007, and then we know that when you're gay at this time, 2007, first comes love, then comes lawsuit. <laughs> what, why did you decide to take this, to take Edie's case on? Well, and how did, that, how did that come about? So Thea passed away in 2009, sadly, and Edie was aware that there was this law in the books called the Defense, Defense of Marriage Act. Mm -hmm. um, and she knew that as a result of the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, uh, that she, her marriage to Thea would not be recognized under federal law, even though it was recognized under New York law. And that would have, like all Americans' death in taxes, that would have tax implications for her. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did. Uh, and she had to pay a very, very large estate tax bill. It was over $300,000. Over $300,000, not because she's any kind of hedge fund or private equity right. person, <laughs> but because like a lot of people, they bought an apartment in the village uh, in the 80s that hadn't cost that much when they bought it, and today is worth a fortune. So she had right. to pay a tax on that, um, and she paid it. Uh, but to use her words, and it was a word that ultimately gets used a lot of times by Justice Kennedy, uh, she felt indignant that she had to pay that tax and that her marriage to Thea was basically null and void for purposes of, the, of her own government. Mm -hmm. So she decided to sue. Um, she went around looking for a lawyer. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending upon how you look at it, for me it was certainly fortunately, she got turned down. For me too. <laughs> um, and ultimately, uh, through off mutual friends, uh, she was, I was given her name. Now, the truly incredible part of the story, or one of the truly incredible mm -hmm. parts of the story, is that when I, my friend called me to say this woman, Edie Windsor, needed a lawyer, uh, I had never laid eyes on Edie, I had never met her. We only lived four blocks away from each other, but I'd never seen her. Wow. Um, but I knew exactly who she was. Um, and that's not because she is what she is today. She wasn't, you know, she, people didn't ask her for selfies and autographs back in, <laughs> back in 2009. The reason was, was that 18 years before, 
Um, I had been in my third year of law school, and I think it's fair for me to say that I was kind of a late bloomer uh, in terms of coming out. Unlike my wife, who went to Smith, I was on a much slower <laughs> uh, in terms of coming out. And I waited until the very end of third year law school, and it just so happens that my parents were visiting. Uh, they lived in Cleveland at the time, and they come to visit me in New York, and even worse luck, it was shortly after I came out, it was Gay Pride Weekend. So they come to visit, I live in a studio apartment, they have to kind of wend their way through the Gay Pride Parade in New York, and they get to my studio, and they're kind of in a state. And my mom says things like, you know, what's with the dykes on bikes? <laughs> and what's with all the, all the rainbows? And, and what are, what's everyone so proud yeah. about? And I, and I said something like, you know, please stop. And as mothers and daughters kind of are wont to do, she continued. And, and, and I said, please stop again. And she said, why? Why do you ask me to stop? Are you gay? And I said, yes, this was 1991. And she went about two feet over to the corner of the building and or my apartment and started literally beating her head against the wall. Wow. Um, it's not about my mom. My mom has apologized 10 million times for this. Mm -hmm. um, when my dad is in a line apparently anywhere, whether it's the barber shop, the grocery store, the drugstore, he manages to tell the person next door that his daughter won a big case at the Supreme Court. So, so my parents- <laughs> I would drop that too. Yeah, I would tell everybody, the dry cleaner, dog walker. Yeah. But, but as you can imagine, I was pretty low. And I went around New York asking, uh, and this is how you talked about it then, asking for a psychologist who was good at gay issues. Uh, and I kept getting the same name, and the name I kept getting was Thea Spire. So I what? actually saw Thea Spire two times only as a patient, because I was moving to Boston in the fall, in Edie's apartment, because Thea was already <laughs> paralyzed. So she saw patients in her living room. Here's beyond the beyond incredible. She actually talked about Edie during those two sessions. I remember her telling me that Edie, she had this woman Edie she'd been together with for many, many years. Edie was a math genius. <laughs> uh, Edie had gone to NYU. I, I can remember that part. Um, and, uh, you know, I think about why she did that. I'm not a psychologist, obviously. I just play one on TV. But, but <laughs> it's, I, I understand psychologists aren't supposed to talk about their own lives. You know, I think the way she did it is I was so despondent. I was so mm -hmm. cynical about the idea of ever wanting to, ever having the life that I wanted to have that she knew the only way she could convince me is to tell me about her own. She talked about this with Edie Windsor. She was incredible. She really helped me kind of come to terms with myself. Wow. Flash forward 18 years, I get the call. Uh, I talked to Edie and I said, um, I, I'll come see you. It would be easier for us to talk in, per in person. I, knew I didn't have to ask her the address. I knew where to go. <laughs> um, when I walked into the apartment, it was kind of like coming back to the scene of an accident, though. All those old emotions came back. I, I said to Edie, you have to give me a minute. And I, and I told her why. And then I said, boy, like, you really don't look the way I imagined you. Like, I thought you were kind of this math, like you'd have like a slide rule, and like thick glasses. glasses. And definitely I was Shock thinking all over flannel her. shirt. Yeah. And I was like, you definitely don't look like that. And then I didn't say this at the time because everyone would have thought I was crazy. But I remember thinking at the time that God had given me this chance to pay Thea back uh, for what she'd done and that I was going to do it. So that, that is the official start of the United States of America. <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, uh. If you all don't buy this woman's book, <laughs> I don't, I have questions for you if you don't. Um, so I know that we're, we're, we're running, we're, well, we have run out of time, but I don't care because I'm going to ask one more, because <laughs> I'm going to ask one more question. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, were you guys, you're going through this case, you're in the Supreme Court, your whole life, right, is on trial. You're having to, you know, validate your, your marriage, your lives. You are now out, right? So your life, in a way, is also on trial. All of ours were. W were you able to separate the personal from the politics of the situation? Yeah. Or, or was that the driving force behind yeah. This enormous win. It, it was. Hard. I mean, I had a post-it when I was working on the brief for the Supreme Court. I had a post-it I put on my laptop that said, "It's all about Edie Stupid," borrowing from the Clinton campaign. And and part of the reason I think I had that up there was to tell myself that we knew that if we could convince the justices 
that the marriage that Edie and Thea had was the same as the marriages that they had, yeah. that we would win the case. So we really focused, laser focused from day one, on, on the love story. Yeah. Um, but I think another reason I had that up there, and it was more, less overt, was that I was trying to tell myself that even though I was obviously a married woman being impacted by DOMA adversely, that my job as a lawyer, and it's true for any client, is to put my own kind of mishigas to the side uh, and to focus only on my client. And that was my goal. And I think we did on our team a very good job of doing that. The only time I can remember where I just couldn't keep it down anymore was at the Supreme Court, actually. Uh, I got a question during my argument from the Chief Justice about politicians falling all over themselves, was the language he used, in order to support our side of the case. He was trying to argue that gays are so incredibly powerful that we don't need the courts Did to enforce our rights. Did he watch TV or no? <laughs> um, and, and when I answer that question, if you listen to it on the audio, my voice cracks. <laughs> um, and when I hear that crack, every time I hear it, I think to myself, that's Robbie Kaplan coming out. Like, I just couldn't hold it in anymore. Um, and I don't think, in retrospect, that was a bad thing. You know, I think the justices were very aware that in two days of questioning between Prop 8 and Windsor, I was the first openly gay person to stand up and address them. Uh, and I think that matters. <laughs> but I never would have told the story about the Aspire being my psychologist <laughs> until we won the case. That's for sure. <laughs> I mean, I, like everybody here, it is beyond overwhelming, the two of you, your intertwined stories, and how you have shaped our history, our lives moving forward forever. Like, you've changed everything. I can call my wife my wife because of you and your courage, because of the both of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you.